So in my presentation, I will address aesthetic, cultural, and affective aspects of Marx's work in the context of his growing production and increasing international uh, recognition. Uh, among other things, I will argue that Marx's documentary work invites spatial, space-based readings of his films. Um, his cinema finds its founding reason in precise places, I argue, which are at once real and metaphoric. Uh, examples uh, are the trains and train stations <coughs> in Travellers, um, the steps outside the London court, a London courting outside the court, or entire quarters, villages and towns, such as the city of Calais in Calais the Last Border, a Cumbrian village in Sunday My Prince Will Come, a seaside Essex town in the curious world of Frinton on Sea, a suburb of East uh, London in All White Embarking, the historic core of London in Man of the City, the A5 road in The Road, A Story of Life and Death. In interviews, Mark has confirmed the importance of space to his cinema, for instance, when he says, uh, when I start a project, I am usually in a space that is suggestive, that has a certain meaning attached to it, and I am looking for characters within that space that can help develop that idea. So in my presentation, um, I will keep the focus on Mark's imagination of space while examining a range of aspects of his work as represented by some keywords. Uh, these keywords in turn will be explored each in reference to one of uh, six films. So these are the films, um, and the keywords are uh, dwelling, uh, moving, stagnating, so with reference to issues of residing <coughs> and, and uh, of moving, uh, and uh, hoping, feeling, and breathing, so with uh, touching upon issues of affect, uh, and being. Um, and I will also look at a number of sub themes, however, uh, or a number of other um, issues uh, under these um, headings. Um, and uh, as you can see, indeed, for instance, from uh, this uh, slide, um, uh, which is you know, about the first film from which I want to start, um, which is uh, Lift uh, from 2001. Uh, this film is almost entirely set inside an elevator in a tower block in East London. Um, I will use this film to set the basis of my conceptualization uh, of Marx's work and method uh, and to begin to explore some of the key themes and features of his work. Uh, the film's spatial narrative and formal emphasis on such a constrained environment as a lift poses key questions not only on Marx's cinema, uh, but also on film as a discursive space, on documentary and its relationship both to discourse and to reality, and on the capabilities of uh, digital video uh, based on its features of lightness, portability, immediacy, and intimacy. Uh, rather than being limited by this totalizing focus, I will argue the lift is opened by it to further readings, notably about the importance of space for our era, and in particular about spatial understandings of the post-colonial urban West and of the common European home. The lift and the film as a whole does present uh, strong microcosmic features. Um, Marx's lift can indeed be said to be a heterotopia in the sense explored by Michel Foucault in his essay uh, of other spaces. For Foucault, heterotopias are places uh, capable of juxtaposing in a single real place several spaces, several sites that are in themselves incompatible. Interestingly, one of the examples that Foucault uses is the cinema, for this is, as he writes, a very odd rectangular room at the end of which, uh, on a two-dimensional screen, one sees the projection of a three-dimensional space. What most interests me um, here of the idea of the cinema as heterotopia is that which makes it similar to other heterotopias described by Foucault, and in particular, the Persian garden or the Persian carpet, which bring together different and even contradictory spaces in a way that makes them look like microcosms. The lift in Marx's film indeed contains the representatives of multiple cultures, places, ethnic groups, ages, genders, and religions, thus becoming a microcosmic rendition of London and of post-colonial Europe. 
In the lift, we encounter all sorts, those who were born in England and those who come from faraway places, first and second generation residents, short-time economic migrants, and people who have fully relocated, old and young, atheists and religious, healthy and sick, single and married, drunk and abstemious, workers and old age pensioners. The sheer complexity of the human and social composition of the tower building is also emphasized by comments and dialogues. For instance, one in which two of the older residents discuss how few white people now remain in the building. A sense of the uneasy cohabitation of ethnic groups and of a deterioration of the urban environment is on occasion suggested by the long-time residents like Lily, who says that when she first moved to the block 26 years um, earlier, she found it was paradise, she says, and then proceeds to complain about the degeneration of the place. Once we even see her preventing uh, a Southeast Asian man from stepping onto the elevator, a scene that suggests the desire of the long-term white resident to protect, protect her space, uh, from the invasion of the ethnic other. This microcosmic rendition of the urban west and of London and East London in particular points at issues such as the increased heterogeneity of the social fabric, the religious divides, the contrasting cultural values and conceptions of life which presuppose other controversial features of contemporary Western urban life including racism, prejudice, social conflict, fear, violence, segregation. However, uh, my argument is Mark's film does not, is not contented uh, to simply present and reconfirm these themes. Quite the opposite, it subverts them, arguably leading to a counter-reading of London. This counter-reading is born from the discursive space created by the film and the presence of Mark uh, in the lift, uh, as I will now argue. I will do so by mobilizing uh, the postmodern political urban theory of Edward Soja, and in particular his reading of third spaces as both real uh, and imagined spaces, uh, as spaces of recombinatorial and radically open critical practice based on a binary defined strategy of thirding as othering. Uh, this strategy can be seen in the way in which the space of the lift is always opened up to an other. Uh, the film pluralizes the other and triangulates subjects, thus constantly shifting and questioning what they may appear and what may appear like fixed positions. By firmly placing himself on sight, then, Mark includes the spectator in such triangulations Firstly, because the position of the camera, of course, always implies the presence of the spectator and his or her point of view. And secondly, because the fourth wall is often shattered so that the spectator and social actor may exchange gazes. In this way, the film produces a contestation and renegotiation of socio-geographical boundaries and cultural identities. This filmic lift may thus be described as a third space where race, age and, age and gender are recombined in a way that defeats the either or binary and that opens to both and to and also. As such, the lift is a polyphonic and dialogical space. Uh, in it, the residents uh, meet the filmmaker, meet each other, and increasingly open up to dialogue and exchange. Via the construction of such an intense, concentrated space through the use of camera angles, framing and montage, and by functioning as a reagent who stimulates this uh, communication and sharing of comments, memories, dreams and stories, Mark creates a space that resembles Foucault's already mentioned heterotopy of the Persian garden or carcass. In this universalizing heterotopia, in fact, all the different parts of the world are brought together in a way that is ultimately harmonious uh, and are able to coexist rather than contest or efface each other. The picture of the tower block that emerges from the lift is in fact overall a positive one. The place looks populated by people and stories and we come away from it with a strong sense of having met a community, 
a diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-faithful community. Thus, the film ultimately puts forward what I believe is a utopian reading of the Tower Block, of London, and of the multicultural common European home. This utopianism, as in the best tradition of reflective documentary cinema, aims not only to represent a reality, but also to make it fully relevant to the spectator. Indeed, Mark's film uh, asks us, the spectators, to look into the heterotopic filmic mirror and to see ourselves where we are not, uh, in a sort of counteraction uh, of the position that we occupy to Sai Foucault. As passengers in the lift, the spectators are required to take on their position in a triangulation of the social space that constantly opens up to an other. Uh, looking back at us, all these others intercalate us and reposition us. One needs to remember that in lift, the spectator is physically in the place of the mirror that is to be found at the bottom of the lift, which is invisible in a sense. We are in that space. Uh, as Foucault writes of the mirror and of our, and our gaze reflected in the mirror, uh, starting from this gaze that is, as it were, directed towards me, from the ground of this virtual space that is on the other side of the glass, I come back towards myself. I begin again to direct my eyes towards myself and to reconstitute myself there where I am. Uh, interestingly, it is the gaze of an other that is at the basis of our own mirroring and reconstitution uh, in the space where we are. So the ultimate quest of the Marx film asks um, uh, of us is indeed uh, about where we are and above all about how we dwell uh, in the city. As a heterotopia, lift has the curious function of inverting and contradicting the set of relations that it reflects. Uh, by doing so, nonetheless, it also throws them into relief. Quite as a mirror, it throws back at us a reversed by faith but faithful uh, image of society. It simultaneously shows realities and possibilities. The same political edge of Foucault's uh, heterotopology and Soja's third space is actualized in Lyft as a post-colonial critique of the common European home, here epitomized by its most cosmopolitan, populous, and multicultural metropolis. Such critique comes into being in an inverted mirror image, uh, but also finds expression more directly. The anxiety about, our, about space that, according to Foucault, characterizes our era, in fact, is not at all absent from lift. One could say, indeed, that the film is framed by anxiety, for it opens with what we could call our birth to the space of the film and ends with our death in it. At the start of the film, we find ourselves uh, in the shaft of the elevator and travel forward uh, through uh, a tunnel, uh, while hearing muffled voices and noises coming from the outside. This sequence establishes that the shaft is like the insides of the building. We go through it almost in an act of being born, and indeed the first sound we hear after the cabin is set in motion is a baby's cry. The film is contained between that birth and a death, that of a fly, uh, trapped inside uh, the elevator's cabin, an image that closes the film. Without wanting to stretch the metaphor immoderately, the fly <laughs> may be likened to the spectator, the invisible voyeur, the fly on the wall, uh, who was trapped in the lift uh, for the duration of the film. <coughs> Together with the sense of that entrapment and with sequences that convey the unease of some of the passengers when forced to share the lift's restricted space, Anxiety is also woven into the film by recurring disquieting sounds and noises like the screeching of the cabin, uh, the wind howling around the building, the barks of distant dogs, muffled sounds and indistinguishable voices. A series of shots taken in the silence and stillness of the night then emphasizes the desolation, squalor and even fear of finding oneself alone in the lift. Foucault describes the Persian garden as a sacred space uh, that was supposed to bring together inside its rectangle four parts representing the four parts of the world, 
with a space still more <coughs> sacred than the others, uh, that were like an umbilicus, the navel of the world at its center, and uh, a basin and water fountain were there. Coming right in the middle of its runtime, the film's navel is a sequence in which Mark is trapped in the lift as a consequence of a sudden breakdown. The scene is immediately followed by one in which an irritated female passenger challenges him rather, rather aggressively, questioning his reasons for standing <coughs> in the lift all day and for making the film. Thus, the navel of lift, instead of being the space that is more sacred than others, contradicts the positive impression of a harmonious mixed community conveyed on balance by the film uh, and significantly replaces the symbolic fountain uh, with images of isolation, anxiety, and aggression. The dystopian image flashes at this time, yet what remains truly unique in respect of lift is that the eloquence of its critique of the European home ultimately creates a utopian um, filmic space, which is given to us to view and contemplate and which makes it impossible for us to hold a fixed position. Space, as we have seen, is for Mark a working method. Uh, meeting people and telling their stories it is at once facilitated and shaped by the spaces chosen for the filming. Such spaces are simultaneously real and metaphorical. In Lift, we looked at the metaphors of birth and death, utopia. Uh, in many ways, Mark's work on space seems to exceed the general understanding of documentary practice as objective <coughs> and neutral, which is, of course, a long-standing legacy of the fly-on-the-wall form of documentary and the myth of objectivity and directness that type of cinema implied. Far from being observational, his cinema crosses perceived generic boundaries and calls for a flexible critical approach. At the same time, the documentary encounter with both people and places is very much at the center of his films. I want to further examine these aspects by an, in an engagement with travelers. The key word here is moving, but as you can see, I will also touch on a number of uh, other issues. In Travelers, Mark approaches a number of people encountered uh, in train stations and on trains and asks them to talk about love. What emerges is, on the one hand, an examination of love, relationships, and loneliness, and on the other hand, a mood piece with a, a particular focus on love lost, love found, and regret. At the same time, Travelers is a look into our lives in transit. Uh, and into the broader human condition in an era marked by impermanency and by liquidity. Space and place in Marx's work are indeed often a metaphor for dwelling and moving, as we saw in Lyft. In Travelers, traveling by train, commuting, and waiting in train stations become metaphors of human life, and more specifically, of the impermanency of our condition. There are at least two aspects to this theme. Uh, one is the way in which people's lives in contemporary Europe are deeply shaped by commuting and relocation as a result of the nature of both work and urban life in our post-industrial, late capitalist times of flexibility. On the other hand, one can discern a preoccupation with the issue of impermanency of identities, relationships, and lives, which characterizes the liquid condition of postmodernity. The metaphor of uh, liquid modernity was famously adopted by Zygmunt Bauman uh, to define the late modern condition of our societies, which have progressed from heavy to light capitalism, from solid to fluid modernity. Fluidity, the quality of liquids and gases, is for Bauman the leading metaphor for the present stage of the modern era, a phase that, at the opposite of modernity, does not strive for solidity, but for its opposite, a phase of deregulation, liberalization, flexibilization of the capital, in which patterns, codes, and rules to which one could conform, which uh, one could select a stable orientation point, and by which one could subsequently let uh, oneself 
oneself be guided are in short supply indeed. For Bauman, the increasing fluidity of the capital has profound repercussions also on social bonds of community and on organized networks of citizens and workers, uh, which reach deep into personal lives too. He writes, any dense and tight network of social bonds, and particularly a, territory, a territorially rooted type network, is an obstacle to be cleared out of the way. Global powers are bent on dismantling such networks for the sake of their continuous and growing fluidity, uh, that principal source of their strength and the warrant of their invincibility. And it is the falling apart, the friability, the brittleness, the transience, the until further noticedness of human bonds and networks which allow these powers to do their job in the first place. While being metaphoric, however, Marx's focus on travelers is not devoid of tangible documentary preoccupations. On the level at which, uh, sorry, one of the levels at which space is relevant to Marx's work is that of social class and the special connotations of social relationships. We already saw how Lyft was at once a specific social reality in East London and a metaphor for the urban West. Here, trains and stations are a tangible example of Mar Marc Auger's concept of the moon place, uh, the place of transit in which community cannot develop. But they also highlight specific living conditions uh, of people who reside far from their workplaces and from facilities and are obliged to spend much of their lives waiting or traveling because of that. A further idea to be highlighted here under the rubric of method is the concept of contingency, which has big currents in documentary film theory, for so much in documentary is hinged on the accidental, on opportunity, and on chance. This can be thought of in terms of issues that come into and that deeply shape documentary filmmaking, much more so than fiction filmmaking, including the encounter, the event, and filmmaking conditions i.e. that broad set of factors with which documentary cinema must come to terms on a regular basis. Contingency in documentary film can translate into a sort of vulnerability, as Bill Nichols called it, uh, but also by the same token in a strength. For instance, contingency becomes visible in the chaotic uh, framing, um, blurred focus, poor sound quality, if there is any synchronous sound at all, the sudden use of a zoom lens, jerky camera movements, the inability to foreshadow or pursue the most pivotal events, and a subject camera distance that may seem too distant or too close on either aesthetic or informational grounds. This is Bill Nichols talking about uh, contingency in general in documentary cinema. Contingency does not always produce a dirty or dramatic uh, effect in documentary cinema, but it can simply become manifest as a chance encounter or as the ability to capture a unique moment or event. Contingency can also be helped, of course, even fabricated, and this is an area that we might discuss later with Mark. So far I have said much about space, but one final consideration stemming from travelers for me is about Mark's work on time and narrative temporality. Uh, Mark often chooses social actors whom he then follows on and off for extended periods of time. The stories of these people interweave in the broader tapestry of the film, thus creating a narrative development with stories that build up progressively, hinged on our interest in both character and in narrative, and at once conveying a rhythm and a general sense of the passing of time, as in Lyft, which via use uh, of exterior images of the building at the start, in the middle, and at the end of the film, it conveys the impression of a story developing over one day, while of course the film is occupied a much longer time. This shows how narration and temporality, rhythm and story, are central and fascinating <coughs> concerns of documentary cinema as much as they are of fiction film, of course. 
if Lyft was about dwelling and travelers about moving, seeing as emblematic conditions of the urban west, uh, many of the city may be said to be about stagnation, as the caption at the start of the film suggests. The film focuses on four main social actors, uh, two middle-aged uh, white men working in the city uh, during the 2008 financial crisis, <coughs> A Bengalese man who lives in a small flat with his daughter and who works holding an advertisement in place for many hours a day till he loses his job. Uh, and an Englishman who works as a street cleaner. The stagnation is the result of an entrapment of the men in their jobs, which are framed as a product of late capitalist post-colonial urban society and a far cry at once from the hope of social redemption held by the fathers of this generation, and from the dream of the wealthy West that attracts countless migrants to European metropol metropolitan areas and to London especially. Some of the key figures that emerge from this film and which are recurrent in Marx's work are metaphor and utopianism. The urban space in which the social actors are trapped is shaped by an apocalyptic metaphor uh, the depiction of the city is somewhat biblical, with an emphasis on water, rain, waves, vapor, reflective surfaces, and hints of Noah's Ark. Not by chance, animality is foregrounded in the film, and the metaphor of the jungle surfaces in the representation of the metropolis, and in particular uh, of the stock exchange. The theme of social Darwinism is dominant, and perhaps surprisingly is presented as a condition shared by both the Western white workers of the city who are quite high on the social ladder and, uh, and by the Bengalese man who uh, has the most precarious and numbing job. In a scene at the stock exchange, the stockbrokers shouting and gesturing is compared to animal sounds and behavior. And the theme of hunting is foregrounded by a stockbroker who talks about it as his hobby. One of the protagonists even spells out the metaphor for us when he clarifies, if we do not make money, we are expendable. Uh, another connection that is drawn by the film is between capitalism and refuse, uh, which abounds and is set in contrast with the luxur luxurious facade of the city. Because of the thematic focus on the city and on the capital, Refuse is presented as the byproduct of the rampant consumption that drives a subtense capitalism. One of the characters, the street cleaner, uh, draws on the metaphor of refuse when he meaningfully exclaims, the city is polluting me, but how do I get out? Interestingly, the only subject in the film who appears to be free from both the cage of consumption and the pressures of social Darwinism is precisely the street cleaner, something that again subverts common understandings of the hierarchical structures of society and that points at Marx's work on the triangulation of subjects that I mentioned earlier. By reconfiguring the place of these men in the city and more precisely by showing how both immigrants and Westerners are the slaves of capitalism and by foregrounding one of the lowliest members of society as the freest subject, uh, this film also can be said to create a third space, which is at once critical and utopian. Such an understanding of documentary as a locus of potential renegotiation and as a space of becoming is in line with recent scholarship such as that of Ilona Hongisto. The metaphorical framework of the film involving Darwinian, biblical, and apocalyptic allusions also deeply influences the aesthetics of the film, giving me an opportunity to say something about this important aspect of Marx's cinema. His films um, often strive to strike a complex balance between contingency and the careful construction of the shot and of the film as a whole. The aesthetics of Man of the City is characterized not only by the recurrent imagery I've mentioned, but also by a way of framing buildings to convey how the modern infrastructure of the capitalist city shapes environment, mood, and feelings. The city is construed as a sort of cage, both by camera work and editing and through a careful soundscape, 
including music and noise. Sound is used to create an atmosphere and even um, to convey a metaphorical use um, of sound. The last theme I'd like to touch on under the heading of this film is that of the portrait. Marx's approach to documentary filmmaking in several of his films is a keen portraiture, intended both as portraying a character, capturing the essence of a subject, and as a particularly emphatic use of the close-up in between aesthetics and affect. One of the characters in the film, incidentally uh, a successful stockbroker, is an amateur photographer who makes po portraits of his children with whom he does not live. The emphasis on his photography is indicative of his loneliness and disconnect uh, from his children, which is a product of his job and of uh, its demands and pressures, but also attracts attention to uh, and it's almost a missing a beam of the presence of the filmmaker, the filmmaker who makes portraits of his subjects. Um, I now want to move to the next three films and the next set of concerns of my talk. While the question of space will continue to be central, this section uh, will place more emphasis on modes of being and feeling, thus shifting the emphasis on the affective <coughs> side of Marx's work but also aiming to convey a number of other topics as I've done in the first part of my talk. I will start with Calais, The Last Border, which I want to discuss under the heading of hoping. Uh, hope is intended here as a feeling of expectation and desire for something, which broadly characterizes the human condition and shapes it as one marked by, at once, need and lack, and by our ability to imagine the future, and therefore, again, by utopianism. Calais is described in the film as the last border, the last barrier that refugees and worker migrants from many parts of the world must negotiate before reaching their destination, England. The film, however, uh, intends the border in a broader sense. Uh, Mark shows us not only Afghans, uh, Jamaicans, and Lithuanians hoping to cross the channel, but also English men and women uh, who come to buy cheap alcohol on a booze cruise, and expats uh, attempting, to, attempting to make a living in France, for, uh, as one of them says, there is nothing for them back in England. Uh, as such, Calais in this film is a cosmopolitan margin hosting rootless people, many of whom are in transition again, searching for safety and for a job or struggling with debt. Uh, Calais thus becomes the signifier of the lack of stability um, and uncertainty of contemporary life and of the necessity for so many to leave their homes in the hope of reaching a better future. Hope and despair are the two poles of the film. I've argued that Mark creates filmic third spaces, real and imagined spaces of openness and critical exchange where binarism is overcome through a strategy of thirding as othering. Uh, in his analysis of Calais, The Last Border, uh, S.M. Dasgupta argues, um, quoting philosopher Jacques Saranciere, that this film um, questions uh, the contemporary form of European community and produces forms of visibility that interrupt the falsely unified and simplified figure of otherness that shores it up. Mark's work is indeed co often concerned with otherness, uh, as we have seen, and issues of multiculturalism, multi-ethnic cohabitation, identity, and social class. In Calais, according to Dasgupta, Marx's strategy is that of a pluralization of the singular other through displacements and disjunctions of meaning and through filmmaking as a way of making visible subjects who occupy a lowly status in both social and artistic hierarchies. And I'm reading from Dasgupta, who writes, uh, through the everyday, though, though not ordinary details of the people living in Calais, the symptoms of a social order that constructs a violent or improper distribution of spaces, nation, state, border, camp, are given visibility. The film's disjunctive threading of dialogue imagery, 
both specific to the medium, has a political stake in that it disturbs the meaning of the designation migrant by both pluralizing the term across different individuals and by establishing relationships between them and us through its configuring of space and time into alternative constellations. Another way of thinking about the same, this same pluralization is via Mikhail Bakhtin uh, and his concept of voice according to which an utterance is always produced by a certain voice, a speaking personality with a specific viewpoint. Specific, specific voices being invoked and informed as responses in the conversational and collaborative situation are also informed by broader sociocultural contexts with a particular history. Bakhtin's idea of multi-voicedness however, does not just mean the mere juxtaposition of voices. New meaning, new insight and understanding is, according to Bakhtin, dependent on the tension between different voices, viewpoints and perspectives. In the film, voices that express a specific viewpoint informed by their particular histories are allowed to enter into a relationship of reciprocal tension, thus creating new insights. Such tension is not just uh, in the now and thus on the synchronic plane, it is also a diachronic tension uh, which emerges through stories from the past, uh, in particular a refugee story in relation to the Second World War. The last shot of this film is that of an open road. Uh, two of the characters decide to leave Calais behind and everything they have there and embark with their two young kids on a journey of hope. This shot is an ideal connection with the next film I wish to comment on, which is The Road. The Road, the story <coughs> of life and death, is one of Marx's most complex and accomplished films. Um, once again, we have a specific place that catalyzes all the stories that are being told and that shapes both the subject matter and the filmmaking approach. This place is the A5, the 300-mile Roman road connecting the port of Holyhead to Marble Arch. We meet here people who migrated to London at different times and from the most diverse regions. Among them, a young Burmese man who has chosen to become a Buddhist monk in London, Irish people from both recent and old migration waves, a Jewish woman who fled Vienna when Hitler was in power, a retired Germ German air stewardess, uh, a hotel concierge from Kashmir who hopes to be joined in London by his wife. Migration, but also more simply relocation for work and impermanency are again at the center of the film's concerns. And the road evokes both broad metaphors of human life and the contemporary condition of liquid modernity and specific social historical circumstances. The film, even more so than Calais, brings <coughs> out the diachronic dimension, not just by referencing prior waves of migration in dialogues and by alluding to the stratification of the uses of the Roman road in time, but also visually by editing old and contemporary footage together. All of Marx's films describe an increasingly multi-ethnic cosmopolitan society while emphasizing and exploring the difficult cohabitation that is so much in view today, at a time when the Europe of free movement in Schengen is deeply questioned and under pressure. But what image uh, of cosmopolitanism emerges from his films? Roads and streets are some of the primary places in which each of us encounters the other. The street is the site of a cosmopolitanism that is visceral, to use a term by Mika Nava, who uh, won uh, a term uh, that suggests a structure of feeling, Nava writes, that exists independently of travel to foreign countries or knowledge of foreign languages. It is a cosmopolitanism that historically has emerged from engagement with otherness and elsewhere in the local zones of the modern global city, the street, the school, the gym, the shopping center, the dance floor. The cosmopolitanism of the street is visceral for Nava in the sense of an empathetic, vernacular, and everyday uh, cosmopolitanism. 
for a Padurai, vernacular cosmopolitanism, or as uh, it's called also, cosmopolitanism from below, has little to do with self-cultivation, uh, universalism, or with the ideals of globalism with which it is historically linked in Enlightenment Europe. Rather, it is primarily identified with cultural coexistence, the positive valuation of mixture and intercultural contact, the refusal of monoculturalism and a go uh, as a governing value, and a strong sense of the inherent virtues of rubbing shoulders with those who speak other languages, eat other food, worship other gods, or wear their clothes differently. Marx films often demand an effective response from their audience, um, in line with this idea of a visceral cosmopolitanism. The road fully explores the double register of the filmic road as a place of desire and anxiety, recognition and displacement. On the palimpsestic Roman road, via which generations uh, of migrants have reached the city, we are asked to get to know the social actors intimately, to identify with them and to feel for and with them. Uh, a lyrical mode also has its place in this film, especially through song and music something that compels us to acknowledge the centrality of the lyrical register to a cosmopolitanism that is born of displacement and that is at once an individual and a universal experience. The accent on lyricism, on feelings, and on affective identification is in line with the recent emphasis placed on emotion in sociological and anthropological research on migration and in interdisciplinary research that explores how emotional processes shape human mobility and vice versa. Marushka Svacek suggests reading uh, emotions um, as dynamic processes through which individuals experience and interpret the changing world, position themselves vis-a-vis -vis others, and shape their subjectivities. As Svacek reminds us, Emotional encounters are not only shaped by direct interaction, but also by memories and imagination. Through work on imagination and memory, Marx Films offers a visceral, if still symbolic, experience of cosmopolitanism in the road. Such experience is distinctively cinematic because articulated through an apparatus which is capable, in such a diverse way, of placing us at street level while also revealing the street to us all at once in its presentness and in its historicity. The last film I want to briefly consider is The Old Man in His Bed, which is a, a short, um, and it's part of 94 Elements, uh, a global project made up of films uh, by different filmmakers, one for each element. Uh, Mark's film is about oxygen, and he explained his choice as follows. Uh, I chose oxygen as it seemed to offer the best <coughs> opportunity to make a film with a simple human story. Myself and Guy King, the researcher, were invited onto a ward dealing with severe respiratory conditions in a London hospital, and the first person we were introduced to was Bob. The hospital staff clearly liked him, and I, was immediately, and I immediately understood why. Despite his desperate medical condition, he was extremely optimistic, remarkably kind, and not without a sense of humor. After a little consideration, I decided to shoot the film with Bob over one long night. I decided just to be there and experience something of his situation without any tricks, complicated structural considerations, or big narrative ideas. I read out this passage in its entirety for it summarizes some of the themes I have tried to look at in my presentation, including this spatial-temporal situation consisting in one room, one night, uh, which again provides a framework for story, approach, and aesthetics. And I would emphasize story, even if Marx says that there is no story in this film. Uh, and also, uh, Marx's method of being there uh, and thus working as a witness, which is typical of documentary cinema, but also as a reagent whose presence makes things more visible and tangible. Uh, Mark's comment also points uh, at another um, uh, important element of his film and of his work to cool, 
uh, the idea of lightness, uh, he touches on humor, for instance, um, or better, <coughs> the two poles of heaviness and lightness. <coughs> the old man in his bed is a film in which the heaviness of the human condition is foregrounded, but also offset by the lightness of the person who bears it. This is often the case with Marx's subjects. They face the most difficult circumstances with courage and often with a touch of lightness. This, however, does not detract from the extremity of their experiences. Uh, indeed, if anything, it makes them more dramatic. The old man in his bed, with its concentrated focus on a human being <coughs> and his physical condition, can also be said to attract attention to the object of documentary cinema itself and to its materiality. Documentary cinema indeed focuses its attention on the existent, that is to say, on actual bodies, things, places, and their contingent specificities and conditions. The heaviness of matter and the lightness of being equally belong to the medium of film in general, and the old man in his bed highlights both aspects. The material conditions with which filmmakers must contend are wholly in evidence with Marx's camera negotiating the filming in a small room full of medical equipment and supplies and occupied by a very sick man. Equally in evidence is the medium's ability to transcend materiality and give visibility to the immaterial. Here, the man's feelings vis-a-vis -vis his own condition and the outside world from which he is now permanently excluded. All of this could be said to be encapsulated by the man's breath, uh, by the heaviness of his respiration and the immateriality of what it conveys it stands for, both as a metaphor of the human condition and in terms of affect. Ultimately, and with this observation I want to conclude, this may be said to be the coordinates of Marx cinema, which seeks a precarious balance between witnessing the contingent materiality of being uh, in historical and social context and offering a metaphorical, sometimes utopian <coughs> reading of the present time. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Lara, for an incredibly insightful discussion of, of six of Marx's films, rich with theoretical references and uh, impetuses, and I, I feel you could have expanded on all of these points um, at great length. and. Um, uh, so this was absolutely fantastic. I mean, you have discussed these films and this, this was eye-opening for me, Thanks. you know, what you have seen in the films. And I think I'm not just speaking for myself here, but probably for everybody in the room. And I think we proceed to part two now and invite both of you to start your dialogue. Should we grab some tea and then? Yeah. Yes, that would be a brilliant idea. And there is a lot of cake too. <laughs> From Lyft, I don't know if you want to say anything about uh, the clipping itself. Like uh, I can't remember what I chose. Just the then. beginning. Just the beginning, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's quite hard choosing clips because you can kind of find something in everything in a way. So they're they're a little bit random, but I just wanted to give a broad overview. So, um, well, did, what, did you have a question? Did you have well, a thought about um, the clip? I mean, it's, it's the first three minutes of the film, I think, just to show you the get a sense of, um, I mean, we could show it and then yeah, talk about yeah, the things absolutely. that come to yeah, mind. Yeah. I think you have to, oh yeah, you can turn it off from there and then back on from there. I think. Yeah. Ground floor. 
Oh. 